Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Palliative Care Grand Rounds. Um, this is the kickoff of the part of the year where our fellows um, give their Grand Rounds. And so now through June, you'll be hearing Grand Rounds from various um, fellows from the Interprofessional Palliative Care Fellowship as well as the Geriatric Fellowship. And um, Mara Hofer is going to start us off. Um, she's a PharmD and an alum of the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. And she's currently cleaning, uh, completing her palliative care fellowship as well as training in uh, pain palliative care residency at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And while she enjoys all aspects of this fellowship, she's particularly interested in pain management and symptom management. So welcome, Mara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I am so excited to be here. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my presentation today will be about the long-term implications of opiate therapy. We have a lot of material to cover. Okay, so first I would like to just start by saying I have nothing to disclose. Um, the two learning objectives we will hopefully meet today is we're going to outline the implications of long-term opiate therapy which can include endocrine, skeletal, cardiovascular, and immune toxicities. And we're also going to um, establish a monitoring plan to detect and manage toxicities of long-term opiate therapy. So why are these long-term implications important? Um, when you're dealing with critically ill patients or patients with a shorter lifespan, it's, it's hard to see past um, their admission or past where you're treating them. Um, so, Let's start with the chronic pain aspect. So they found that more than 30% of Americans are living with some form of chronic pain. This graphic is a little misleading because anyone who treats patients with chronic pain knows that um, most of them have the comorbidities of uh, diabetes, heart disease, or cancer. But um, since 2001, the Joint Commission uh, had pain as the fifth vital sign. Um, and since then, pain has been more adequately treated, which, in which is increasing our opiate use. Along with chronic pain being more adequately treated, the cancer death rate has been falling, which has been um, incredible. Since 1991, the cancer death rate fell 26%, and these are stats from 2015. Um, so really what that means in terms of numbers is 2.6 million um, Americans are alive today that wouldn't have been alive if they received their treatment in 1991. So more cancer survivors um, uh, is incredible. However, there's more... Uh, complications from their cancer treatment and then long-term pain that we're going to be treating with opiates. Those two pieces aside, um, the opiate epidemic is on the rise, but the fortunate thing about uh, the opiate epidemic on the rise is that there's more uh, treatment, there's more patients being put into uh, addiction, made addiction uh, uh, treatment. So the two opiates that we have, methadone and buprenorphine, um, they're both being uh, steadily administered. And that's the, the amount of patients that are on these are on the, also on the rise. So these are just listed here for you, just for completion's sake. These are just the common adverse effects that we typically think of in our practice. But we're really going to dive into the uh, adverse events that are not as common. So we're going to look at opiate-induced androgen deficiency, uh, we're going to look at the impact that opiates have on the skeletal system, the cardiovascular instability, immune suppression, and then we're going to briefly touch on sleep disturbances at the end. So starting off with endocrine effects. So let's start off with the patient case. So this, we have a 25-year-old uh, testicular cancer survivor seen in clinic for the management of his chronic pain um, currently. He has three evidence uh, or three years no evidence of disease. Uh, he had a single opendectomy. Um, he's currently on oxycodone 20 milligrams every four hours as needed for um, residual um, chemotherapy related uh, nephro or neurotoxicity, as well as um, deconditioning due to his disease. So recently he's been mentioning that he has um, sexual dysfunction that he didn't even have during his treatment, worsening anxiety and feeling like he can't get out of a slump. Just keep this in mind as we go through um, this disorder. So opiate-induced androgen deficiency, we're so lucky to have so much evidence and to know uh, really the clinical implications and the impact of um, the decreased se uh, sex hormones in this patient population. 
The prevalence is unknown. The primary preliminary evidence suggests as high as 90% in chronic opiate therapy um, in a few uh, larger studies. The risk factors that can compound this um, complication are listed here for you. Um, but you know, increasing age, increasing weight, um, other comorbidities can also increase the risk of decreased sex hormones. So opiates are not the only uh, common offender that we see. We also see um, all of these agents listed here for, uh, for you. So it's important to also screen for patients with chronic alcohol use, marijuana use, et cetera, when you're thinking about what's causing a decrease in sex hormones. So how does this work? So we're just going to do a brief overview of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. This is a very basic of what um, happens in, the, um, in, a health, in a healthy person's body. So the hypothalamus will release gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which will stimulate the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone and uh, follicle-stimulating hormone to the testes and the ovaries, respectively. Now, the testes and ovaries will release testosterone as well as estrogen and progesterone. Now, what happens when you add opiates into the mix? So there are tons of opiate receptors on the hypothalamus, the pituitary, as well as the opiates and the, uh, as well as the ovaries and the testes. So the opiates will bind to the opiate receptors on the hypothalamus, which will decrease gonadotropin releasing hormone being released from the hypothalamus. They will also bind to the pituitary, which will um, also decrease luteinizing hormone and FSH being released, um, which will indirectly decrease both testosterone and progesterone. There's also opiate receptors on the testes and the ovaries, which will directly decrease te testosterone as well as estrogen and progesterone release. So um, I mentioned that we're really lucky to have a ton of data about how this occurs in the prevalence. We also have a ton of data on the settings and the routes that this happens, and it happens in a variety of both of these things. So we've seen this in both animal and healthy volunteers. We've seen it in active opiate addiction, methadone for maintenance therapy, chronic non-cancer pain, as well as acute and chronic cancer pain. We've also seen it um, not only in the oral uh, routes, we've seen it transdermal, intravenous, and intrathecal all have the potential to reduce sex hormones. So what are the consequences? So the male and female have slightly different consequences. Males will have the inability to um, perform coitus, as well as females will have symptoms that mimic uh, menopause. Um, they're listed here for you, but really what we're looking for in clinical practice is the inc increased depression, anxiety, decreased libido, um, and decreased ability, uh, and decreased sexual function. So an interesting theory that has arisen is does hypogonadism cause increased pain by itself? Well, like without opiate therapy, will it cause increased pain? So um, they took, so what had, what, how they found this out and how this theory arose is they took rats, they castrated the rats and compared their um, pain sensitivities to rats that weren't castrated. Now, when they, they found out that the castrated rats had, in, had more pain and, um, uh, and a less tolerability to pain than their um, counterparts that had intact sex hormones. Um, so when they reproduced this study and gave both sets of rats opiates, they found out that the rats that were castrated required more, uh, had a higher opiate requirement, had less analgesia from the opiates, um, and worse outcomes. Um, and another um, theory that kind of confirms this theory, another thing that they think is, that, along with hypogonadism gonadism causing increased pain, is that the reduced pain threshold in women is thought to be due to decreased testosterone. So they also, there was a testosterone supplementation in opiate-induced androgen deficiency um, in androgen, uh, opiate-induced androgen deficient men that resulted in the improved quality of life and increased pain control from opiate therapy. So just correcting the testosterone actually improved the um, patient satisfaction with their opiate regimen. Um, we'll talk about that study in a few slides. Um, the incidental finding, they also found that in women with AIDS-wasting syndrome, when they replaced the testosterone, they were actually looking for uh, if testosterone repl replacement in women with AIDS-wasting syndrome will increase muscle mass um, and improve outcomes. However, 
uh, by coincidence, they looked at pain as a secondary outcome and found that the testosterone replacement in these women actually will reduce their pain. Very interesting. So even though we have all this great data and it's arguably one of the most known long-term um, consequences of opiate therapy, there's no guidelines that have been established for monitoring or treating. So what um, experts recommend is that patients over 100 morphine milliequivalents should be monitored for the development of hypogonadism. Um, you can monitor using standardized questionnaires, which are all validated and um, all great. There's a St. Louis Andro University androgen deficiency in the aging male, the aging male symptom scale, and the Massachusetts male aging study. Um, just a side note, I have a little bit of hometown pride about this uh, slide because the, say, the Adam uh, standardized questionnaire has a sensitivity of 97% while the Massachusetts male aging study has a sensitivity of 60%. <laughs> so um, laboratory testing, the testosterone for men is listed for you. Um, women is a, little bit, um, is a little bit more tricky to measure their uh, sex hormones due to the variation of luteinizing hormone and F FSH throughout the month. So what experts recommend is you're actually measuring the DHEAS and replacing if deficient. It's really unknown how often to test. There's no recommendations, but in clinical practice, it's recommended to wait until there's clinically significant uh, symptoms that we mentioned previously. So going back to our patient case, he reported these symptoms. We thought this may be happening. We tested his testosterone, um, which was lower than the lowest, uh, the lowest minimum of 300 uh, at 180. So with testosterone's low, what are we gonna do about it? So there's three things we can do for management. We can discontinue opiates, we can do opioid rotation, and we can do hormone replacement therapy. So let's talk first about discontinuing opiates. So this is, this, the feasibility of this option is um, minimal. However, um, as with all patients with our, in our chronic pain population, um, alternate therapy should be pursued in an effort to decrease opiate use, really maximizing the uh, uh, maximizing the alternate agents and alternate therapies. Um, however, this is, you know, it, the uh, applicability of this is minimal, but this is the best option that we have. The, after removing opiates, they found in patients who had a past heroin addiction, they removed the heroin. Um, testosterone levels were normalized in about a month. However, they've done studies in patients who are on, um, who were transitioned off of opiates for um, opiate-induced androgen deficiency, and they found that quite, like, um, the ability to uh, maintain an erection could come back in uh, as little as seven to 15 days. So, um, so the body can bounce back fairly fast. So before initiating opiates, um, it's, if you're suspicious that a patient may already be distant exhibiting some of the symptoms of sexual dysfunction, increased anxiety and depression, it's best to correct the testosterone levels and continue to monitor throughout their treatment um, on opiate therapy. So let's talk about testosterone replacement therapy, where again, I'm gonna continually talk about how lucky we are to have such great data about this, but um, there was a study where they actually replaced the um, testosterone in 23 androgen deficient men on long-term opiate therapy. So they applied transdermal patches for five milligrams a day for 12 weeks and then increased to 7.5 milligrams a day for 12 weeks, regardless of their baseline testosterone. Now this had a decrease in symptoms, decrease in pain intensity score, and decrease in pain interfering with daily activities, and as well as a secondary outcome of decreasing um, actual opiate use. Some complications with testosterone replacement therapy are listed here. Um, I just wanna highlight that it can exacerbate sleep apnea, which is another uh, long-term side effect of opiates. We'll talk about later. So looking at female hormone replacement therapy, um, unfortunately, we have very little evidence regarding this um, treatment for women, but estrogen, progesterone, or DHA supplementation is uh, indicated if levels are found to be suboptimal and patient cannot be rotated off of opiates. Um, you can also use um, oral contraceptives to replace these hormones. Um, and then there, they, these medications as well come with um, heavy complications of cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, as well as mood disturbances. So opiate rotation is kind of the most attractive choice. However, there's no, no evidence to support this. Um, 
it's unknown which opiate has the most uh, endocrine depressing side effect. Um, however, buprenorphine may have less impact on the endocrine system than methadone when it was compared. Um, but it's the ability that buprenorphine still has to depress this is still there. So going back to our patient case, um, since we had that great study of 23 men with opiate-induced androgen deficiency and they replaced the testosterone, we decided to follow what they did and replace the testosterone at 5 milligrams a day for 12 weeks. And then um, I think we're at week nine now, but we're going to reassess the symptoms in three more weeks, and we can increase to 7.5 milligrams a day. Um, now, the goal of of his, he has no evidence of disease, so we're going to start titrating off of opiates. He's um, completing physical therapy to really deal with his reconditioning and deal with his chronic pain syndrome. So we've um, used this um, opiate-induced androgen deficiency to really drive the point home that he shouldn't be on opiates long-term, and it really is going to affect his daily life. So he was in agreement that we're going to titrate off of opiates, and we're and that's going very well. So moving on to skeletal effects, um, I just have to point out this is my favorite slide in the whole thing. <laughs> um, so the prevalence of this is, is also unclear, um, but the evaluation of patients on opiates more than 10 years determined that 20% had osteoporosis, and this was a study of uh, 3,000 patients who, had, who were on long-term opiate therapy. Um, a few epidemiologic studies can report a uh, 1.5 1.4 to two times increase in risk of developing osteoporosis um, for patients who are on chronic opiate therapy. Now, the risk factors are listed for you. Um, the, the, the more risk factors the patient's on, obviously the risk will be compounded. But as you can see, there's a few modifiable risk factors here, such as alcohol, tobacco use, smoking cessation, um, and uh, low body weight and inactivity, um, and long-term glucocorticoid therapy, just to keep in mind. So let's do a quick review of how bone homeostasis occurs. So the osteoclasts are going to bind to the bone and it's going to reabsorb calcium into the bloodstream, right? So um, this is going to decrease, decrease the bone. It's going to, um, and then macrophages will bind to the decreased bone, uh, priming it for osteoblasts to bind and then we'll reabsorb calcium from inside the bone or from inside the bloodstream, and then the bone will be reabsorbed. Now this keeps the bone healthy, um, keeps everything in homeostasis. Now, of course, just like in my last um, animation, once you add opiates, everything kind of, um, everything is, is not good. So um, the, there's three mechanisms of how they think this occurs. There's no consensus on which is um, the most plausible, but it's, probably a combination of all three that will increase the fracture risk and increase the osteoporosis. So sex hormones keep osteoclasts in homeostasis. Now, as we talked about with opiate-induced androgen deficiency, as the sex hormones uh, decrease, this will actually accelerate the osteoclast. So this will have kind of unbridled uh, breakdown of the bone. Now, there's also a ton of opiate receptors on osteoblasts. Now, the opiates, when they're introduced into the system, will bind to osteoblasts and will be, and which will not allow the osteoblasts to bind to the bone, which will um, not allow for the remineralization of the skeletal system. The third theory of how the increased fracture risk, increased osteoporosis, or increased fracture risk happens, um, opiates can uh, famously cause sedation as well as dizziness, increasing the fall and decreasing the bone. All right, so the increased, the increased, the incidence of osteoporosis in men receiving chronic opiate therapy has been found in a small study, small, medium-sized study, 350 patients to be 50%. So 42% out of the 50% with low bone mass densities had normal testosterone levels. This is why that, um, uh, experts think that it's not just the decreased sex hormones because these these patients had normal testosterone levels. The the huge issue about this study is half of the patients disclose that they smoke, and it's um, unsure how many of the 52 percent were included in this osteoporosis with the increased fracture risk. 
There's been an association that has been seen in a large epidemiologic and clinical study. So investigators examined a few central nervous system active agents, and they found that both um, opiates as well as anticonvulsants will increase, um, will decrease the bone marrow density and increase the risk of osteoporosis. Um, a meta-analysis of eight cohort studies uh, show that the overall combined risk for the use of opiates was 1.88, and this um, study also found that the risk of hip fracture was two times the uh, rate of patients who were not on opiate therapy. And this meta-analysis um, uh, adjusted for confounding variables, um, and then as well as a nested case control study investigated opiate use for non-cancer pain and fracture risk. Um, this, this was really interesting because it uh, sectioned out the opiates by name, and they found that buprenorphine had the had no increased risk of fracture while ever other opiate did. Very interesting. So again, just like the previous uh, opiate-induced androgen deficiency that we talked about, there's no consensus in the literature regarding monitoring patients receiving opiates chronically and routine bone marrow density screenings. So morphine, what they found is that morphine mill equivalents more than 50 milligrams a day will double the risk of fracture in the elderly. So the expert suggestions include decreasing opiate use below that uh, morphine mill equivalent of 50 milligrams a day, reducing concurrent psychoactive medications, as well as screening for concurrent osteoporosis and osteopenia risk factors. And as well as really maximizing your preventive measures like we do with patients who, um, who are at a higher risk of osteoporosis and general clinical practice. Worse. So um, adequate nutrition and vitamin supplementation, uh, calcium and vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D enhances the absorption of calcium. The thought is that the enhanced amount of calcium in the, blo the blood will enhance the amount of calcium in the bones. Um, as you guys probably know, there's the recent literature on this is uh, there's no consensus if this is clinically uh, beneficial to the patients or not. But it's it's still important for patients to have adequate nutrition and vitamin supplementation. So um, also as well as increasing physical activity. Now this is probably the most challenging one besides discontinuing opiates because in our chronic pain population, um, it's incredibly hard for them to perform their, if they can't perform their ADLs, having a clinician telling them that they need just to increase their physical activity to um, reduce their risk of osteoporosis is not going to be beneficial. As well as reducing modifiable risk factors of um, low body weight, uh, malnutrition, smoking, chronic alcohol use are all things that we can counsel to hopefully prevent. So moving on to cardiovascular effects. So the cardiovascular effects in general, we're going to be talking about QT prolongation. We're going to be talking about arrhythmias briefly, but we're mainly going to focus on the QT prolongation. So how does this happen? So we think about QT prolongation clinically or commonly in practice, but a question I get um, all the time is how, what is the mechanism of this? So um, potassium channels are really important for the electric activity um, of the heart. Uh, Agents that have the ability to block, to prolong the QT interval will block some of these, uh, a very specific potassium channel, um, which will disrupt the electrical uh, disturbances as well as, and then increase the QT prolongation. This can lead to torsades and sudden cardiac death. Um, what's considered prolonged is 450 milliseconds is borderline and over 500 millisecond, milliseconds is um, considered extremely prolonged. So let's talk about methadone. So we commonly think of methadone uh, in practice, right, as, as increasing QT prolongation. We do the ECG monitoring. We um, really look at all the numbers, but what does it really mean? I had a colleague who conferred to me about um, our, we had a discussion about a patient he treated for a very long time, a very young sarcoma patient who had a really difficult to treat pain condition even after being cured of his cancer. Now he was on um, moderate dose, 120 milligrams of methadone for about 15 years. Now the methadone allowed him to have a uh, life where he could do the things that he, um, that he wanted to do. However, 15 years after being on this methadone therapy, he um, had a sudden cardiac event, which caused him to suddenly pass away with no other risk factors. So this stuff does happen, unfortunately. Um, and we really do need to, to think about 
the detrimental effects of methadone, especially in a long-term setting. So one of the most shocking things I found when I was putting this presentation together is that methadone is the leading cause of torsades for prescription drugs. It's not the leading cause of torsades for prescription drugs that we use in palliative care. It's not the leading cause of ones against opiates. It's the leading cause in all prescription medications. So they found that it causes um, almost 12% of all ventricular arrhythmias, 2.6 for QT prolongation, and 1.7 for torsades. So it, torsades can happen over a wide range of doses. They found it in any dose number of doses from 65 milligrams to 1,100 milligrams a day. Um, this is thought to be dose dependent. The risk is going to increase as you um, have more methadone on board, as well as it will um, the the length of time that the patient's also on methadone will also increase the risk. So the QT prolongation effects are thought to begin at doses of 80 to 100 milligrams a day is when we're really going to um, need to nail down uh, good we'll monitoring for this. Top um, An interesting thing about methadone is that the IV version causes the most QTC, drops of all, um, QTC prolongation of all of the formulations of methadone, and this is because it contains a preservative of chlorobutanol, um, which has an additive QT prolongation effect. I called her an interesting thing to note. So we have great data about methadone, right? We know that it causes QT prolongation, oh, but how does it compare? So it's compared commonly against buprenorphine because buprenorphine is our other opiate agent that's um, used commonly in our addiction population. So we have great data about buprenorphine, and we have great data that buprenorphine does not, um, does not have the potential to block these potassium channels in the heart or causes electrical disturbances. Um, so it's a few, almost all studies suggest that buprenorphine is safe and will have no effect. Um, so this uh, comes with a little asterisk because um, they did a study in rats where they administered 15 milligrams per kilogram of buprenorphine, uh, and it showed an irreversible QT slowing and increase in heart rate has been seen. If any of you have patients that are on even 15 milligrams of buprenorphine, please come see me after the presentation. <laughs> um, so at normal doses, it's been shown and proven to be safe. In combination with naloxone, as in seen with suboxone, it's also shown to be safe. Very interesting thing about buprenorphine is when it's used in combination with antiviral, antiretroviral therapy, the QTC was increased significantly. And now, this isn't because of the mechanism of buprenorphine specifically. It's because it, buprenorphine will increase the, increase the levels of antiretroviral therapy in the patient and um, Antiretroviral therapy can typically increase the QT prolonging uh, risk. So, the more the increased level, the increased levels in the blood increases the risk. Just something to look out for in our HIV and AIDS population. Moving on to morphine and hydromorphone. So, the cardiovascular effects of this, of bradycardia, vasodilation, hypotension, decreased cardiac output, um, are either related to the histamine release or the centrally mediated uh, mechanism. It's up for debate, but um, morphine potentially will have no effect on the QT interval. It doesn't have the potential to block that potassium channel. Um, however, they, uh, there was a study in Taiwan in breast cancer patients who were administered morphine versus breast cancer patients who were not administered morphine, and the ones that were had an increased risk of arrhythmias. They've tried to duplicate the study two times and um, found that, and could not replicate the results of the Taiwan study, but it's um, something to note. Um, hydromorphone has not been noting have an effect on the QT prolongation or uh, the arrhythmia risk. Moving on to the class of fentanyls. So fentanyls is complicated because there's contradictory evidence of the effect of fentanyls and sufentanyls on the QT prolongation. So most of our data that we have from fentanyls are in our emergency and our anesthesia literature. So these are going to be emergent or um, operative situations. So they found that remifentanil has no effect on the QT, however, will slow down the heart via the mechanisms um, listed here for you. And then there's a really extremely low risk of QT prolongation with the fentanyls. However, as the potency and dose increases, there have been shown to be a few instances of arrhythmia, but however, there's no um, instances reported of death due to arrhythmias from fentanyls. Great. So, um, uh, in the interest of time, I just listed a chart with other medications with the potential to cause QT prolongation, uh, levoporphenol and codeine, 
two agents that are not commonly utilized in practice have no harm, uh, as well. Um, tramadol, meperidine, opium, and loperamide have harm identified. Loperamide only um, has harm identified as in there's a one case report of a patient who drank 400 milligrams of loperamide. And if you, I know, I know, I said the same thing. <laughs> um, and so if you know anything about um, loperamide, we give it at two milligrams. So if, you're, if your patient is not chugging boxes and boxes of loperamide, they pro they, I can confidently say they will not have an increased QT. Uh, interval due to that medication. Um, Aperidine is not used in practice anymore due to CNS side effects as well as cardiovascular side effects. Opium and tramadol are moderate, just something to look out for. And it's unknown if Nucenta, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, or oxycodone can increase the QT prolongation. There's no data saying it does. However, there's no definite data saying that it doesn't. So how do we manage it? So um, we can minimize the medications that can increase the QT interval. So uh, as you add medications and as you add doses of medications that can increase, that can block these potassium channels, um, your risk increases. So decreasing the class one and three antiarrhythmic agents such as amiodarone, some antibiotics such as clarithromycin, um, other common palliative agents such as olanzapine, um, uh, odansetron, et cetera. Um, decreasing that. Something that's missed commonly in practice is decreasing drug interactions um, with agents that increase the levels of QT prolonging agents. Like just what I talked about with buprenorphine and the antiretroviral therapy, um, that's, uh, it's important to look out for things that will increase the dose of methadone in the body, for example. Um, and consider other factors and collect cor correcting electrolytes. A lot of the time, the potassium in the body itself will be low. And once that's corrected, the QT prolongation will go back to normal. Um, the non-pharmacologic treatment of cardiac pacing and defibrillation without secretized shock. I can talk very knowledgeably about the first three, but the last one I will leave to the physicians in the room. Um, and I just, for completeness sake, I just wanted to talk about opiates by arrhythmia risk. I talked about um, morphine having the potential of um, the moderate risk of causing arrhythmia, but I just wanted to mention that buprenorphine and hydromorphone have, have not had any arrhythmia seen after administration. Um, fentanyl, oxycodone, tramadol, morphine, and uh, hydrocodone all have um, little pieces of data showing that it can cause arrhythmias, but it's unknown at what doses and at what time. And then opium and methadone are at high risk for causing um, arrhythmias. Moving on to the immune system. Now, this is the question. Um, I'm sorry, thank you. So this is the section that I get the most questions about because it's the most unknown. So this is really the effects of opiates on the immune system it has a really unknown clinical benefit, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. So it's this is incredibly interesting. So pain and the impact of the immune system. So pain itself may impair the immune function by its effect on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system as well as suppressing natural killer cells. So without introducing opiates into the system, pain itself can decrease the immune function. Um, opiate therapy will, when you introduce opiates, they will impair the function of other lymphocytes, macrophages, and antibodies, um, and they can reduce nociception and reduce the stress response to pain. We're gonna get into that statement. So this is so cool. So they think that it's, they think that it's mu receptor mediated. So they took, they took rats again and they took out their, um, they found when they administered, um, they found out when they administered morphine that natural killer cell activity and T cell proliferation response was decreased. When they took out the mu receptors, they found out that, and administered morphine to these rats, they found that the natural killer cell activity in the splenic T cell proliferation was preserved. So they think that this is actually mu receptor mediated. So, <coughs> so it's, yeah, so through the mu opiate receptors. The risk is dependent on the agent, um, just like I talked about at the last slide. So even though hydromorphone and morphine are both highly potent and short acting, hydromorphone has been found definitely not to decrease the components of the immune system while morphine has been shown. Um, the study in Swiss mice referred to uh, morphine and oxycodone um, administration will impair splenic 
uh, proliferation, natural killer cell activity, and IL-2 production. However, dilated encoding treatment will result in no impairment of these cells. So most of the data that I will talk about on this slide comes from uh, very uh, non-human studies, so rats and um, kind of preclinical trials. Um, we're going to talk about the innate immunity and the effects that morphine we know has on the adaptive immunity. So the innate immunity are going to be your, um, is what, just a quick review, it's what you're born with. Uh, these are going to be your epithelial and um, barriers as well as your macrophages, um, et cetera. So starting out with the macrophages. So morphine has been shown to decrease phagocytosis, uh, cytokine production, um, it decreases macrophages activity to um, kill bacterium, as well as the inability, it, morphine will decrease the ability of the body to recruit macrophages to the site of infection. For neutrophils, it, morphine administration will decrease the cytokine and chemokine production, as well as um, the effects that we saw in macrophages of decreasing the bacterial cytal activity and decreasing migration to the site of um, infection. The mass cell, uh, the effects that morphine has on mast cells is it decreases TNF alpha um, activity as well as it will decrease membrane, membrane permeability. In our gut, we have um, a ton of mast cells in our gastrointestinal system. And so when um, morphine decreases the mast cell um, activity, it will release histamine into our GI tract and it will increase the permeability, allowing more bacterium to get through. Um, and na natural killer cells will have decreased cytotoxicity. Dendritic cells will have decreased antigen presentation and as well as the actual intestinal, the integrity of the intestinal barrier will begin to be degraded by the um, administration of morphine. So going over to the adaptive immunity, now these are going to be your B and T cells. So what is the effect that morphine has on the B and T cells? Well, I'm going to tell you. So the T cells, it will, morphine will decrease the TH1 cytokines as well as decrease the amount of T cells that are actually activated. For B cells, it's going to decrease the actual antibody production. It's going to decrease um, uh, MHC2 expression, um, and as well as decreasing B cell proliferation. It can also increase TH, it can increase uh, T cell death and increase TH2 proliferation. Um, all of these together paint a really clear picture that morphine will decrease pathogen clearance. Now, so I talked about immunosuppression being opiate dependent previously. So what these are the agents that have been studied and the ones on the left are um, the agents that we know can suppress the immune system and the one on the right are shown not to be immunosuppressive. So as you can see, this is not a complete list, but this is all the agents that have been studied and that we know about. So what does this mean for our patients and what does it mean for your practice? So it really has uncertain relevance. We ha don't know the, um, prevalence. We don't know at what doses or at what time, but we do know that higher rates of community-acquired pneumonia were seen in patients who are chronic opiate users. Um, in patients that were studied who had rheumatoid arthritis, they found that um, the risk of ho hospitalization was greatly increased in, in, um, due to infection during periods of active opiate intake. Um, and then higher risks were also associated with longer acting and potentially immunosuppressive opiates as well as over 60 milligram uh, morphine milligram a day. So somebody who's also, who's chronically immunosuppressed with uh, a CNRRA population, as well as administering opiates has been shown to increase hospitalization. A recent analysis of opiate use in non-cancer pain did not find an increased incidence of infection as a side effect of long-term treatment. So there's the contradictory evidence of the actual um, clinical relevance of the findings of the, of the immunosuppressive findings of long-term opiate use. So just to um, finish this presentation up, I'm going to briefly talk about sleep disturbances. So um, most, most of our patients will report 
that they have um, increased difficulty sleeping, whether it's falling asleep, staying asleep, quality of sleep, um, feeling fatigued to sleep is a huge issue in, in, in our patient population. So there's conflicting resu results on sleep quality. However, we know that chronic opiate therapy has increases, greatly increases the risk of central sleep apnea. Higher prevalence of sleep apnea, um, chronic nocturnal hypoxia, um, kind of um, a downward escalating slope. So the risk factors that they found for opiate-induced central sleep apnea is morphine milliequivalent equivalent of over 200 milligram a day, lower normal um, BMI, and con the combination of opiates and benzodiazepines. Now, um, they found, they've done interesting studies on methadone and the quality of sleep. The methadone has a direct relationship between dose and sleep apnea. The risk factors for this are actually increased uh, BMI in a longer duration. So direct relationship between dose, time, sleep apnea. So um, one thing that I just didn't, uh, that's not cited on the slide, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention that chronic opiate therapy actually decreases REM sleep. They did, uh, they took sleep studies of patients on chronic opiate therapy, um, analyzed their REM sleep and found out that uh, REM sleep was more than 80% reduced in patients. So patients, even if they were able to fall asleep, able to stay asleep, they were not able to be as well rested. Um, and this is a chronic condition that I think is really important for you guys um, to look out for and to know. Um, I just, uh, con the conclusions. Um, opiates, so we know that these effects happen, right? And it, the thing is, we're not gonna stop using these agents. There are great agents which have a great place in therapy and help so many people. However, we cannot continue to use them chronically without knowing these side effects, monitoring for these side effects and really advocating for patients, either reducing their opiate requirements or, um, or monitoring and treating these effects. So the long-term implications can decrease the quality of life. Uh, the opiate therapy should be reassessed for appropriate lists constantly, which is, I think is a conclusion of every uh, presentation about opiates. Um, just a quick few thank you. I just wanna say thank you to um, Dr. Bridget Scullion, uh, Dr. Ben Kamatic, uh, my Dana-Farber Far Pharmacy mentors who helped me put this presentation together. The Harvard Interprofessional Palliative Care Fellowship mentors have been instrumental in helping me um, pick a topic and put this, uh, my slide deck together, and as well as the immense and continued support from my co-fellows. And with that, I will be more than happy to take any burning questions. Thank you, Mara, that was fantastic. I wanna see, are there any questions? Thanks so much, that was really very comprehensive and, and excellent to, as reminders for all of us to be mindful of deprescribing whenever we can. Yeah. Um, one of the things you brought up earlier on and um, didn't go in to talk about was the issue of hyperalgesia and just sort of helping helping us remember to think about that and the frequency and whether we see it with particular opioids versus others. So the question was hyperalgesia, does it occur? Um, the frequency, the prevalence uh, does occur frequently with more opiates. So I think what they found is that the longer opiates continuously stay in your system, so the higher doses of long-acting opiates will can, um, increase hyperalgesia. However, they don't know the prevalence of it. Um, it's not, uh, severe hyperalgesia is reported in case reports, but not studied independently. Um, but I, I think you bring up a great point that it's something that's continuously overlooked. And it's, it's really hard, especially in an outpatient setting, to remember and to treat because what's the treatment for it? Removing opiates, right? Which is very scary for both the clinician and the um, patient. But yeah, great question. Sorry for the vague answer. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Other questions? I wanna open it up now to um, Dana Farber and to um, Care Dimensions to see if there are any questions from there. Mara, I wonder, my question is how, um, when you're initiating opioids, 
or when you see a patient on opioids, how often in clinic do you address all of these issues and let patients know about these as potential side effects? So the question is, how often do I address all of these issues? So I think, I think the most important thing, if you take away anything from it, is just knowledge. Knowledge is power. So if you, um, I actually, I have to admit, I don't think I would have caught my patient case if I wasn't putting this presentation together. Like it was in the forefront of my mind. We found it, we caught it, we're treating it. His quality of life is so much better and I'm so lucky for that. But um, I think that just being able to recognize the symptoms of decreased um, uh, function, no matter which side effect it is, I think is just, I, I don't, to answer your question, I don't routinely check for all of these symptoms. It's just something that um, I want to make sure that I think about if someone's reporting symptoms to me. Great question. Thank you. I just want to check one more time. Any questions from Dana Farber? All right. Mara, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, everyone. It's an honor being here. Thank you.